Greetings, I'm Enraged Eggplant and welcome to Dungeons and Gerbs. In this video I would like to introduce you to a campaign setting that I created for my D&D style Gerbs games. A very important part of tabletop role-playing experience for me is the setting. D&D has many published settings – Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, Dragonlands, Eberron, Dark Sun, Spelljammer, Planescape, Ghostwalk, Birthright, Mistara, and more. Pathfinder, as far as I know, only has Galarion as an official setting. Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, and Galarion are close to the so-called generic fantasy setting. If you have been in the online RPG community, you probably know that many people passionately hate them. However, I love Forgotten Realms and Galarion. I think they are good settings, especially the former. I cannot say anything about Greyhawk because I'm not very familiar with it. I enjoy reading setting supplements, they have many good ideas that you can steal for yourself. I never use pre-made settings in D&D or Pathfinder, because I felt that if I insert something self-made into them, other players who might know the setting well might get mixed feelings about that. Plus, I always created my own settings of dubious quality. However, that was a good learning experience. Now I know exactly what I want from a setting and have a universal system without any constraints, so I can finally create a setting I will enjoy playing in, and hopefully other players will enjoy it as well. First, what I wanted to accomplish was a variety of options in all aspects. Some would call it bloat or kitchen sink, but I am a proponent of this so-called bloating. Since this is a D&D-like setting, almost any character concept from D&D or Pathfinder can be realized. This is why the world of Karilan has many different races, power sources, magical and martial traditions. The world itself is larger than Earth. One world map hex equals to 500 miles. An Earth-sized world would have a hex size equal to 250 miles. This gives enough room for different nations with different histories, cultures and opportunities for adventures. This helps making the setting persistent and able to support many different types of games, not only dungeon delving. I'll be honest here, the world is this big due to a miscalculation. I wanted to create an Earth-sized planet at first, but messed up and then decided to just keep the result as is. Second, I wanted the setting to be internally consistent. One of the things I despised in D&D was the large amount of interesting lore that typically was only mentioned once and then never explored further or supported, mostly because only a few of the supplements were available on the SRD, creating a need for supplemental material that does not require any supplements other than the core books. In Karilan, I tried to piece together the lore pieces I liked from the aforementioned systems and see how they would interact. I even had to look up the fun-made D&D meta timeline. From the mechanical point of view, my desire for consistency forced me to standardize magical traditions so they would use the same framework. The base framework of GURPS is advantages and disadvantages, so most supernatural powers are based on advantages. That's mostly variants of sorcery. I have intentionally omitted all optional rules or house rules regarding the playstyle, so the setting can be used both for realistic and cinematic games. Also, I intentionally never mention the TL of the setting. It can be played either as a proper TL3, TL3 with TL4 weapons and armor like Dungeon Fantasy, or proper TL4 with firearms. It works well for any of the listed options. So, let's talk about the actual setting. What is Karelan? It's just another fantasy kitchen sink setting. As I mentioned before, I try to fill with opportunities for adventures of many kinds. Valiant knights fight dragons, wizards explore ruins of ancient civilizations, pious priests follow the calls of their gods, thieves and bandits vie for supremacy in the urban underworld, spies try to infiltrate royal courts, the world is populated by haughty elves, industrious dwarves, savage orcs, crafty halflings and a plethora of other races. You can play an adventurer who only cares about finding valuable loot and slaying monsters in the dungeons, 
or be a commander of an army of knights. You can be a lowly thief trying to make a living on the streets, or a wealthy baron managing your fiefdom. You can play an absolutely mundane warrior concerned with defending his home village from bandits and hungry wolves, or you can play a sorcerer obsessed with unraveling the magical mysteries. If you want, you can even be the dragon that protects his horde from pesky thieves and armor-clad knights, or a necromancer bent on world domination. Regardless of the scope of your quest, be it killing dire rats in a wine cellar, or stopping a demonic invasion from the abyss that threatens the entire planet, you will influence the world, leaving a mark in its history. All you need is to read the rulebook, find some friends and roll some dice together. And everyone should have a good time that, hopefully, will be fondly remembered later. The world was crafted to facilitate different types of characters and adventures. In terms of geography, Karyolan is a planet with five continents – Ariel, Mishtafalon, Aventan, Taeldo and Ondo. All continents are connected to one another, as this world has a lower hydrographic coverage than Earth. I generated the map with hexographer and then edited it in manually a bit. If you are looking for tectonic plates, oceanic currents and for geography that would make sense in the real world, you will not find it here. Most of the world is inhabited, but not everything has been explored thoroughly. The world has a long history, most of which was generated using the Turning Points of History article from Pyramid 341, while many of the nations were also created semi-randomly using the World Builder's Guidebook for AD&D. You do not need to read the timeline or memorize the entire history of the world, most of the characters will only know the most important events from it. The history was created mostly to give the world some background and to develop it organically into its current state. I will go over each continent and give you a very short overview of the general situations, because it might be difficult to find a suitable place for your adventures. Aventan is the smallest continent of Karelan. In the ancient times, most of its coastal lands belonged to the kingdom of Aventus, but after the flood and fall of that nation, uh, the survivors have spread further from the coastlines, populating the entire landmass. Dozens upon dozens of successor states have waged war against one another, allied, separated, and even to this day the continent is a patchwork of kingdoms. The dominant racial group of the continent is humans, but there is significant presence of dwarfs and some other races. The climate ranges from temperate to tropical. A significant portion of the continent is covered in deserts. The Mesh Desert in the west, the Teji Desert and the Sanguine Barrens in the northeast, and the Voicelands Flatlands in the south. They are sparsely populated, but usually still are considered to belong territorially to some nations, inflating their territories. The only mountain range of the continent is called the Tripont Mountains. The Seven Peninsula in the southern part of the continent contains several nations. Nations of Aventon are very different. There is the xenophobic theocracy of Hevroia, the benevolent kingdom of New Aventus, the religiously torn Nekax, Meshnars, where sand giants use humans and gnolls as slaves, the Nassan democracy of Eclorus, the matriarchal militaristic nation of Kenaid, the recently leaderless and anarchic Mocha, Sanden, that is controlled by merchant guilds, Chezen, where the dead walk among the living, and many, many others. Mishtafalon is a huge continent that is traditionally split into four parts – eastern, western, northern and southern. While there are clear borders between eastern, western and northern Mishtafalon, it is not very clear where southern Mishtafalon starts and when it becomes southern reaches. Same thing applies to northern Mishtafalon. Mishtafalon is very racially and culturally diverse. There are several human cultures, elven colonies and nations of many other races. The largest nation is the Sadolian Empire, a human empire built on meritocracy where a cadre of psionic gleaners scan the population for talented individuals. Among other nations, there is Ankumat, 
ruled by a dragon pharaoh, Sed Ali, a Silvan kingdom of raptorans and gnomes, Kertil, a nation guided by the spirits of its ancient heroes, the serpent realms that are home to various reptilian humanoids, a tortured land of spry where elves and humans desperately are trying to fight back against an invasion from the far realm, a godmind theocracy of Viril Aventus, Malas Cyril, where black dragons rule over tribes of lizard folk, Sebekia, another lizardman nation ruled by the god Sobek in the flesh, the otherworldly fortresses of Mevarra, the technologically advanced dark dwarven nation of Tandril, and many others. Tael, though, is a large continent where any kind of landscape can be found, from hot jungles to frozen mountain peaks. It has access to three oceans, Aventian, Bright and Savage, and to the two northern seas, the Sea of Misery and the Unknown Sea. The most significant mountain chain is named after the most commonly known inhabitants, the Goliath Holds. The ancient Aventus had no influence on Taeldo, and its most powerful nation, the Singo Empire, felt no effect of the flood that destroyed that old kingdom. Most nations of Taeldo only contact Aventan via maritime trade, as the shortest land road between the continents is blocked by the Virum lands, that are incredibly dangerous to traverse. Just like all the other continents, Taeldo is very diverse. For the most part, it is the so-called Orient of the campaign setting. This is where you can find the bureaucratic Singo Empire, Po Ang, where ninjas and samurais are aplenty, Mahasam, a jungle nation of traditional mysticism and powerful magic, the floating islands of the upheaved lands, the great steppes populated by horse nomads, but also the tyrannical theocracy of Tumethis, sea raiders of Tarnard, a magocracy of Patara, and many other regions. Aril is a continent that is traditionally split into three parts, northern Aril, everything to the north of the Perdition Mountains, Central Ariel and Southern Ariel. In the ancient times, much of the Northern Ariel was occupied by the Elven Empire of Sail Ariel. A magical cataclysm caused the empire to collapse into different splinter kingdoms and principalities that over time merged, separated, and otherwise interacted. The dominant racial group of the Northern subcontinent is the Wind Elves, and Central and Southern Wood Elves. But there are many other races there too, including some humans. Here you can find the fanatically righteous elven kingdom of Sifaril, the Niogi colony of Pktal, the windship raiders of Zakvashir, Citeril, the forest kingdom of the wood elves, and many unexplored lands and other nations. Most of the Undo continent is covered in wild lands of different biomes that are not settled by the civilized races. This is where the ancient dwarven kingdom of Stad Und was situated and where it fell due to a cataclysmic accident. There, among the dwarven ruins, dwell dragons, giants and other monsters. This land is difficult to reach, but it promises riches to the dating explorers. It is home to several human cultures, of which the Patakli is the most well-known one. The northern reaches are the northern glacial lands eternally covered in ice and snow. From there began an invasion that threatens every nation in the world. A horde of white dragon spawn, white dragons and other malicious entities attack everyone inside trying to conquer as much land as possible in their zealous drive to go south. They are followers of Albranthanilar, the greatest of the white dragons. The southern reaches are their southern counterpart. From there began another invasion that threatens every nation in the world. Armies of ice power elementals, frost giants and other icy creatures attack everyone in sight, trying to conquer as much land as possible in their zealous drive to go north. They are followers of Cryonax, the ice Archimental. Below the surface of Kyrilon exist systems of vast underground caves and tunnels interconnected with each other. They are populated by mostly hostile creatures such as the Ilithis, Drow, Durgar, and others. The Underdark has as much history and treasure as the surface world, if not more. Tunnels in the Underdark extend for miles, some ballooning into caverns thousands of feet across, 
only to shrink to spaces too narrow for a halfling to squeeze through. The larger scavern halls are often representations of the surface in miniature, with hills, valleys, underground rivers and lakes. Most races native to this realm make use of the walls and ceilings of the caverns, accessing the higher levels via nature or magical flight or levitation, or even wall-crawling mounds such as giant spiders or certain breeds of lizards. The Underdark is divided into three levels. The Upper Underdark, also called Upper Dark, is close to the surface and its residents have considerable interaction with surface races. The inhabitants of the Middle Underdark, also known as Middle Dark, tend to see surface races as potential slaves. The Lower Underdark, also known as Lower Dark, is an incredibly strange place filled with alien societies and bizarre cultures hostile to those unlike them. Some areas of the Underdark are infused with fire's dress, a magical radiation that interferes with divination and teleportation magic, making magical navigation more difficult. This radiation may also may cause various mutations, but those who dwell in such areas often have access to protective measures. The Underdark includes draw cavern cities, sunken abolite strongholds, Surviving columns of the Mind Flayers, the Vandros Vistas shrouded in everlasting darkness, uncounted hundreds, perhaps even thousands, of deeply buried caverns and lightless cities exist beneath Carillon, and many surface world dungeons seem to connect to murky depths from which all sorts of horrors can spew forth. Carillon's history has a connection to the ocean, as even the calendar counts the years from the flood that has affected the entire world where Carillon does not have vast oceans that could be found on other worlds of its size, there is still enough place for many underwater realms, adventures and treasures. Most land dwellers consider the sea as inhospitable as the Underdark, if not more. Some even call it the Undersea, but this term did not take root in the vocabulary. The underwater expanses of the oceans contain entire thriving kingdoms, Quaterio is the most well-known one, lost cities of the land dwellers, sunken ships, city-states and tribes of various underwater races. The deeper parts of the ocean, especially the trenches, are as unexplored as the lower dark. Far above the surface of Carillon is the sky. This is the realm of clouds, winds and thunderstorms. New clouds take shape as older clouds drift away and slowly dissolve. The sky is also home to mystical beings of various kinds, some of which have formed cities and citadels among the clouds. Despite its height, the sky is not natureless. Even ordinary clouds often contain substances used as fertilizer. Cloud-dwelling cultures have gardens, possibly forests, and use cloud-raised cotton for clothing. Clouds are constantly in motion, moving at a speed of 30 to 150 miles per hour, so the sky is impossible to map out. However, there are some static clouds magically fixed to float over certain places. The most well-known cloud construction is the cloud rod, a network of cloud rods that can be accessed via special towers in the tall mountains of the world. It is unknown who constructed the cloud rod, but the ancient scrolls say that merchant caravans have used it to travel across continents and oceans, but nowadays it is rarely used due to being very difficult to access. That was a short overview of the setting, but I also have to give you an overview of the setting documents that will be linked in the description. There are five documents. Carillon Primer, Lands of Carillon, Races of Carillon, Languages of Carillon and Powers of Carillon. There should also be the sixth one, Organizations of Carillon, but it is a work in progress. The main document is Carillon Primer. It contains a foreword, a short guide on how to use the documents, a short guide on how to get started with playing in the setting, as an inexperienced player or GM or an experienced one, a chapter with optional occupational templates, new advantages, disadvantages, modifiers, skills and martial arts. The document also presents a simplified approach to languages in the setting, something akin to what you could find in D&D 3.5. And the final chapter is new equipment. The Lens of Carillon document has the world map, 
a short history of the world and the descriptions of all the various nations, regions and other places of interest of Karelan. It also describes the cosmology and calendar. There is absolutely no mechanics in there. The Languages of Karelan document describes a detailed approach to languages of Karelan. It is a highly optional document for those who enjoy linguistic complexity. It is designed to imitate the linguistic system of pre-3.0 editions of D&D. The powers of Karelan document details everything related to magic and other supernatural powers. If you want to play a wizard, priest or any other character with supernatural abilities, you'll have to consult it. The Races of Karelan document describes all the various races and cultures of Karelan. All documents have links to my blog, other resources and D&D supplements. Of course, as a player, you really should not read these documents in their entirety. Just read a short description of the relevant nation, general house rules, and everything else can be skipped or skimmed. Nation descriptions are short and vague to avoid overloading the players with unnecessary details and to provide room for your own inventions and creativity. I have to say that I really enjoyed creating the setting, hosting games in it, playing in it, and I greatly appreciate all the support, feedback and critique I got from my players and or friends. I often find mistakes or inconsistencies or get new ideas, so the documents are frequently updated. If you find this topic interesting, I can make more videos about the setting to make it easier to digest. For example, arcane traditions of Karelan, humans of Karelan or something else. But in any case, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.